Hey guys, I'm Nathan from Arms and Armor. Today I want to give you a little preview of a lecture I'm going to be giving next weekend, uh, January what, 13th and 14th, 2024, at the Valley of the Sun Cutting Tournament down in Phoenix. Uh, the talk is about misconceptions we might develop about historical swords from pursuing HEMA. And so I'm going to be looking at a variety of original swords that have characteristics that are different from what we generally see used in things like this cutting tournament and uh, what we generally connect with the sword fighting systems of the Lichtenauer and Fiore traditions. So to begin with here, I want to show you a sword that I'll be bringing uh, down there. It's one of our bohemian broadswords. And this, despite being called a broadsword, right, I would call a longsword, it's a hand and a half, you can get a second hand on there. Broadsword, we called it that just because the museum it's in, <laughs> calls it a broadsword, broadsword, longsword. These are received terminologies, right? They're not something that was probably utilized in period that much to distinguish between different things so much as it was just a preferred terminology. In general, I'd say a long sword has a handle that's long enough that two hands can be used on it, but don't have to be. So the interesting thing about this sword, as you can see here, is that the cross section of the blade is hexagonal, right? So it is flat with long bevels on each side that go straight down to the edge and has this fuller here near the hilt. If we get out here toward the point, this thing is a fillet knife. And this is really common in medieval swords for several hundred years, having a really thin cutting end of this blade rather than the kind of flattened diamond cross section that is the most popular blade style that's reproduced today. Um, I think that this type of blade geometry is really underrepresented today in modern reproductions, and for a few reasons. Uh, one is that during the second half of the 20th century, there were a bunch of really cheap hexagonal section blades that were coming out of you know, Toledo. Uh, Spain and uh, other kind of lower end sword making areas at the time that had no distal taper. They were just a sharpened bar. What you should know about this is it goes from a quarter inch down to uh, a piece of paper, right? So there's really extensive distal taper uh, down uh, this blade. The other reason is that they're really hard to grind these facets in straight uh, by hand, which is the way that we grind our blades. Uh, and most people, you know, do. Uh, it's really difficult, it takes a lot of skill. Uh, since you have to establish this facet that's on much less of an acute angle than it is on a diamond section sword, which means it's easier to mess up. So when you combine that with a lot of sword buyers being relatively unaware of how frequently these kinds of cross sections were used, we see this kind of uh, lack of representation in the modern market. So again, here you go, Bohemian Broadsword by Arms and Armor. Now I've got a couple of antiques too we can look at. So I grabbed this guy, it's 12th century uh, European arming sword in part because uh, Gus Trim and I were talking about it on a, a Facebook discussion a couple uh, weeks ago, and he had said that this was a sword that, when he had picked it up back 20 years ago, he was really surprised by the dynamics of it, and it is quite surprising, right? It moves in a way that is quite a bit different than diamond section swords. It has a pretty massive pommel, and this blade is paper thin, pretty much the whole length. If you look at it, it actually is not completely flat. Instead, it has a very subtle fullering, or it's slightly 
concave uh, the whole length of the blade. Uh, so this thing is essentially, uh, it's basically flat, but with a little bit of a concavity running out the whole length. And when you look at this piece, it does not have a diamond section. And this is a sword uh, that uh, is documented in several of Ewart Oakshot's uh, books. It's a piece that he owned uh, that I'll have some higher detail photos of at the Phoenix event uh, for folks to look at. Next, we have this 13th century sword uh, of European origin, I think probably German. It has this little cross in the pommel. This one's weird because it has a dinky little tiny pommel and the blade is quite heavy. And you can see here, that's actually a lenticular section blade with an offset fuller, uh, the whole length of it. And you can see up here, this flare into the hilt, which is pretty asymmetrical. This is probably at least in part from sharpening uh, the blade after it was made. You can see these nicks on the edge down here. And with my finger behind it, I think you can see it, uh, that are right where we would expect them to be really for combat. Down here as well, we have some nicks in the edge. This sword I think is interesting because it is heavy, it's point heavy, and it has such a small pommel on it. Right? I think that it frankly feels quite unwieldy to people today who are sword fighters uh, fighting on foot. You could get a second hand on here. Right? It's not a strictly one-handed sword, so you can put some, some power uh, into cuts. I think it was probably intended mostly for mounted use. Uh, but perhaps not, right? Maybe someone just liked a heavier, chunkier sword, uh, which was historically accurate in this context. So I'll elaborate on a bunch of these themes uh, down there. Looking forward to seeing everyone who will be down in Phoenix, and uh, we'll post some more images and some more fun. Thank you. Take care.